So now, today's webinar, again entitled CLSA COVID-19 Research Update, uh, please allow me to introduce our esteemed panelists. We have Dr. Perminder Reyna, uh, Dr. Teresa Lou Ambrose, and Dr. Nicole Basta. And I'll just do a very brief uh, biography overview of, of each now. So Dr. Reyna is the lead uh, PI of the CLSI, CLSA, <laughs> I almost said CSI there, uh, the Scientific Director of the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging and a professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster. He holds a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Geroscience and the Raymond, Raymond and Margaret Labarge Chair in Research and Knowledge Application for Optimal Aging. Dr. Raina specializes in the epidemiology of aging with em emphasis on developing the interdisciplinary field of geroscience to better understand aging from all, all the way to society. Uh, next, we have Dr. Teresa Lou Ambrose. Uh, she is the site lead at the University of British Columbia for the CLSA. She is a professor in the Department of Physical Therapy, and she is also a Canada Research Chair in Physical Activity, Mobility, and Cognitive Health. She is, direct, she is the Research Director of the Vancouver General Hospital Falls Prevention Clinic and Director of the Aging, Mobility, and Cognitive Neuroscience Laboratory. Dr. Lou Ambrose is known internationally for her work in randomized control trials of exercise with cognitive and mobility outcomes amongst older adults. And last but definitely not least, we have Dr. Nicole Basta. She is an associate professor, a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health in the School of Population uh, and Global Health at McGill. She is an infectious disease epidemiologist and interested in the prevention and control of infectious diseases, including evaluating the uptake of vaccines and the impact of vaccination programs and, and in identifying factors that increase disease risk and risk of severe outcomes. She began collaborating with the CLSA when she joined the McGill uh, faculty uh, back in, actually, earlier this year in 2020. And uh, may I just say she's been a great uh, person to work with and a uh, valuable asset to the CLSA. So now I will pass it over to Perminder, who is our first speaker, and I'm going to go get a glass of water after uh, that long introduction. Great. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, and thanks to Teresa and Nicole for uh, doing a call uh, presenting at this webinar. Um, this is a quick update today about the CLSA COVID research that we have been doing uh, for past, I guess, eight months. Uh, it's amazing that eight months or ten months have flown by, and we are still talking about uh, COVID-19. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the, what's happening in the context of the CLSA, and then Teresa is going to talk about uh, one of the sub-studies, uh, Brain COVID, and then Nicole will talk about uh, some of the dashboards uh, in relation to some of the data that is coming out of the questionnaire-based uh, CLSA study. Um, okay. Surely I'm trying to advance it. Okay, here it is. So uh, what I would like to do is to remind some of you who are probably on the, on the webinar and not uh, familiar with CLSA, I will give you a quick overview of CLSA. It will be very quick. And then launching to uh, three studies that we are pursuing in, as part of the CLSA COVID-19 studies. One is a questionnaire-based study, Second one is a zero prevalence, and then on the brain health and brain health, as I mentioned, will be uh, presented by uh, Teresa and then the dashboard. And before I begin the presentation, I want to acknowledge uh, co-principal investigators of the CLSA, uh, Christina Wilson, who's at McGill University, and, and Susan Kirkland, who's, who's at Dalhousie University, and they all have been involved in the design and the execution of the, uh, the first two studies and to some extent with the third, the brain study as well. 
So quickly reminding you, CLSA is a research platform of 50,000 Canadians between the age of 45 and 85 at the baseline. And CLSA has two uh, cohorts, even though it's a one study, within that we collect data two ways, which is the 20,000, which is a random sample of the Canadian population across 10 provinces. And data for this group of people, we only collect by uh, telephone interviews. And each one of these individuals are followed every three years for the, uh, until 233 or until their death. And then we have a more comprehensive component of the CLSA, that is 30,000 individuals. And actually the number was 30,097. And these individuals are selected randomly uh, within 25, 25 to 50 kilometer of 11 data collection sites that uh, exist in Victoria, uh, in Vancouver, uh, Surrey, Calgary, Winnipeg, um, Hamilton, Montreal, Sherbrooke, Ottawa, uh, Halifax, and Memorial. So it's a mixture of small cities, medium-sized cities, and large cities. This is where much of the more in-depth data are collected. We do home interviews. Once that is done, we set up appointments for people to come to our data collection sites in any of these 11 sites that I mentioned, and they go through detailed physical assessment and also provide blood and urine samples. Again, uh, there are common sets of data that are collected from both the 20,000 cohort and the 30,000, so we can pull them to be a 50,000 cohort, but there are unique features in either one of those uh, data collection processes. And we also, uh, with the consent of the participants, collect their health card numbers so we can do sometime in the future linkage with the healthcare databases. And this gives you a bit of a sense of where the, where the CLSA participants come from. As I mentioned, the names that are written there, those are the sites, and then the other dots in, other, in each one of the provinces represents the, uh, the, the tracking cohort as well. And together, the tracking and the comprehensive actually give us a national sample. Um, obviously, we were in the middle of our follow-up to data collection uh, for the CLSA when uh, the whole issue of uh, SARS-CoV-2 came into. And uh, we had actually suspended our data collection on March 8th, anticipating that it was going to be an issue, and we didn't want to, at that point in time, uh, because there was so much unknown, I wanted to expose our participants who are generally older and our, our staff. So the face-to-face the -face collection of the data uh, was suspended, and it is still suspended to a larger extent for the CLSA core, but we very quickly migrated to telephone interviews. We established all of our staff members to work from home and collect these data. And during that time, it also became quite apparent that we were in an ideal position to also launch some of the COVID-19 studies. And on April 22nd, very quickly, this was one of the fastest way, <laughs> it was one of the fastest organization and implementation of a, a questionnaire in the context of the CLSA, and we launched it on April 22nd. So within a month, we were collecting data. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more. And the idea was that we wanted to sort of collect data that can help inform some public health uh, policy relevant questions and also allow us to understand that the dynamic of this infection, people's behavior, and generally how it impacts their psychosocial outcomes related to all the things that are happening related to COVID-19 pandemic now. And we are also in a great position to look at the data we have collected as part of the baseline follow-up and sort of look at what is becoming, uh, turning out to be a new terminology, long COVID. And I think CLSA is situated well to look at some of those types of questions as well, whether it be from genetics perspective or social risk factors perspective or 
general health-related risk factors and their consequences during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so as I mentioned already, the CLSA data includes so much rich data and then collecting data that we are doing in relation to the COVID-19 questionnaire study, it actually provides a great opportunity for us to look at many of the risk factors. Um, in many ways, when we started with this, we were thinking mostly from the point of view, what would agency like Public Health Agency of Canada would want to know in order to design some of the public health policies related to uh, lockdowns related to restrictions, social isolation, and so on and so forth. But as I mentioned, it also provides opportunity to look at some of the long-term questions related to pandemic as well. It was launched in April. Uh, we had two modes of data collection, one web-based and also telephone questionnaire. And this was done to, uh, there was 20 to 25% of the CLSA participants don't have access to internet, so we wanted to make sure we capture them as well. And the way we designed study that for a month we were going to be, after the baseline was done, the questionnaire, which was a bit longer questionnaire, and I will come, to, come in a bit to describe what was included in that questionnaire, we also sort of structured weekly data collection for a month, and then after that we were moving into bi-weekly for a month, and then for um, and then we, for three months we were going to do monthly uh, data collection. And over time, this we have tweaked a bit um, because I think we were putting a lot of burden on our participants, the amount of data we were collecting. So, so there are weekly, there are biweekly, and then there's a monthly. And right now we are in the field collecting the last monthly, which is a bit longer questionnaire, which we are talking, we sort of labeled it as an exit questionnaire. Now, the question which we are discussing, because the pandemic is still happening, surge is happening, so should we be collecting additional data some point in future, or that becomes part of the core CLSA when we do launch our follow-up three, and those discussions are ongoing. So for this study, from a reliable sample, uh, we uh, recruited around 28,000 people. And this was originally funded uh, through the McMaster Institute for Research and Aging, McMaster University, and at McMaster we have a, a Jowinski Research Institute. And more recently, uh, this is not finalized, but we are acknowledging that public health agency has also uh, contributed to the collection, uh, collection and analysis of uh, these data. So what is in, what was the uh, data collection look like in relation to the COVID-19 uh, questionnaire study? Obviously, we wanted to collect data on risk of infection and severe outcomes. We wanted to look at COVID-19 symptoms. We collected data on how many people in the CLSA uh, tested positive if they went for a test or their physician had told them that they have potentially uh, they're positive with SARS-CoV-2. We also wanted to understand their behaviors in relation to the public health uh, type of behaviors that have been in introduced over this pandemic. And we also wanted to look what other social challenges that people are facing, including access barrier, barriers to access to healthcare services, economic impacts, access to uh, transportation, and obviously um, anxiety and mental health type of uh, outcomes as well. And so that's the questionnaire-based study. And then in October, as CLSA is really situated well to understand what was the overall burden or what is the overall burden of infection in older population, like the population uh, CLSA has, working with the Canadian, Canada Immunity Task Force and Public Health Agency of Canada, we received additional funding to actually understand the zero prevalence or prevalence of uh, infection at a population level. And these types of studies are generally known as zero prevalence study. And mostly what we are doing is to collect blood samples from people and look at the presence or absence of antibodies uh, in, in the CLSA participants. 
Now, this is this was launched on November 2nd, by 2020, and what a time to launch something like this, as the nature of the pandemic is changing rapidly. This is being done on 19,000 CLSA participants, and we are collecting, and I will describe that in a minute, we are collecting blood samples, and these will be analyzed on a Roche platform at our uh, collaborative laboratory in Calgary, the clinical laboratory in Calgary. Um, as I mentioned, the CITF and Public Health Agency of Canada, the Government of Canada, has invested $4 million to collect these data. And these data will be merged with other uh, seroprevalence studies that are ongoing in Canada to give an uh, overall picture of what's happening in Canada in relation to antibody prevalence. So how are we doing this study? Uh, we are doing some venous blood collection because when we planned it, uh, the pandemic was stabilized a bit. And we are running into some challenges, and if we have time, we can talk about this later. We, we are collecting some venous blood. That means that people have to come to our data collection sites. We target around 6,000 people across Canada who will provide blood samples uh, to us. And we are collecting around 50 mils of blood, and in addition to that, we are also administering a telephone questionnaire and that is designed by CITF. And we are uh, looking at, again, some of the similar things that we collected before, but we wanted to collect at the same time as the, as the blood collections were happening. And, and there is a proposal right now, which, needs to, which still uh, needs to be determined, is that we might, depending on how this study goes, do a, another sample collection in six to eight months from now. And in addition to this 6,000 that we are collecting venous blood, that is a face-to-face -face data collection, because generally we have collected blood only in our comprehensive part of the CLSA, but if we really wanted to have a good sense of seroprevalence of SARS-CoV-2, uh, we want, actually wanted to like to collect on everybody. So we have we have also included the tracking participants in in this study, and and they, there's a total of 13,000 people where we are mailing this device, which you see on this slide, where people will uh, prick their index finger and they take a few four to five drops of blood, place it in that uh, red holder, and then there are little capillary tubes in that device, it sucks the blood up and puts it on a filter paper. And, and as part of this uh, self-collection, we are also sending either the telephone or an online questionnaire, and we want to collect data on how they are collecting samples so we know we can look at the, any pre-analytical issues that might be or the quality of the sample collection. Again, uh, this is a pretty uh, uh, labor-intensive work. It's simple to collect, but then we have to take this device apart, take the filter paper, and take the dried sample and extract it, make it a liquid, and then send it to our uh, lab in in Alberta. And this is a collaboration with the Boston Microfluids and FedEx because they are really helping us uh, uh, collect the sample, and we got very good collaboration with Boston Microfluids and FedEx is helping us take it to door to door and pick up uh, many of our samples within um, as soon as the sample has been collected. So this is the, the, the structure of these studies, and we are still collecting. Uh, we are still beginning to look at some of the initial uh, data, but they are being cleaned. As you can imagine, these are not simple data sets that can be Clean quickly. So our staff at uh, at uh, data uh, data curation center are working really hard. And our goal is that we will be disseminating these data to researchers sometime in the new year. Once we have, we do have some obligations to produce some publications and reports as uh, uh, as a condition of getting funding to launch this study. And the way we have thought about the data dissemination to general research community is that once the data are ready, the people who already hold uh, CLSA data, they are current holders of CLSA data, um, they will, if they want data as part of their current agreements, 
uh, they will receive this data added to their existing database. So this will be an update to their database. And, and then it will be available to other researchers uh, when they apply for a regular data uh, access to the CLSA. And, and as part of that, if they require, they will check the checklist to say they would like to have the COVID-19 data set as well. So there is some internal data analysis that has to happen as per uh, funding agreements. Then there is a current holders of the of the data. They will be given priority to have access to these data. And as per usual data access, uh, people can apply and ask for these data. So I'm going to stop here as far as this overview is concerned, and I'm going to uh, pass it on to Teresa to talk about a third study, which is the impact of COVID-19 on cognition and brain health. I just want to make sure that there's no other. Uh, yeah, this is over to Teresa now. Somebody has to hand over the ball to Teresa. Oh, she has it. Yes, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm just um, trying to figure out which slide we're at. So here. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks, Philminder. Um, so, um, and thanks for having me today here at the webinar. So, um, uh, I'd like to take probably the next 10 minutes just to briefly describe the uh, upcoming CLSA COVID-19 brain health. Uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge that funding for this particular subsidy of the CLSA um, is provided by the Canadian Institute of Health Research as well as the uh, Western Brain uh, Institute. Um, of course, uh, the entire CLSA team is involved, um, but in terms of this particular sub-study, um, I also like to acknowledge that uh, Eric Smith, who's from the University of Calgary, is also a co-lead um, of this particular study. So in terms of um, the COVID-19 brain health um, study, our goal is to actually explore the impact, so both the intermediate and, and perhaps the longer term um, aspects of COVID-19 on human cognition and brain health. So um, I think in the initial months of the pandemic, um, most of us quickly realized um, that COVID-19 seemed to impact the nervous system and such that individuals with um, COVID-19 infections were presenting with strokes as well as delirium and um, acute inflammation of the brain. Um, and now what has emerged over time is that it appears that COVID-19 um, may also have uh, fairly covert implications as well, such that uh, it's been documented that individuals who perhaps had a mild case of infection upon recovery, um, there's still fairly tangible cognitive um, effects that's being um, observed. And certainly there is also more reports coming out now that those who have been infected are reporting the, you know, the feelings of being in a brain fog. And so where the CLSA uh, COVID-19 brain health stands apart, I think from existing efforts in understanding the, the neurological impact of COVID-19 is that we're more focused on the covert neurological consequences and again, the longer impacts. So um, how we will approach this particular sub-study is that um, from the CLSA COVID-19 questionnaire data, so uh, Parmenter has already described what that is. So within that questionnaire, we can identify individuals who either reported um, uh, experiencing COVID symptoms or have been tested positive for COVID-19. And we want to compare them to those who um, have not reported having any COVID uh, symptoms or who um, um, tested negative for COVID-19. And in terms of the neuroimaging aspects, we're very interested in, again, in more covert manifestations, including markers of um, cerebral small vessel disease, uh, looking at white matter integrity, as well as efficiency of brain functional networks. In terms of the study flow, we are aiming to initiate the study um, in January 2021, whereby we would acquire baseline MRI. In terms of the sample, the minimal sample size we're hoping to achieve is uh, roughly 656 to a maximum of 1,000. Um, along with the MRI, we would be also um, implementing a brief um, phone assessment of people's cognition, as well as mood and lifestyle behaviors, which I'll describe in the subsequent uh, slide in more detail. Then within, this individual, within the um, 
cohort of individuals assessed at baseline, a subset will then be reassessed one year later. So it'll be the first 240 individuals scanned um, at baseline. Again, a brief phone uh, assessment will accompany that repeat of MRI. And then two years later, we hope to rescan re all individuals who were, uh, who were assessed um, this year. Again, comp uh, with a uh, phone assessment accompanying the neuroimaging aspect. So we have a um, fairly tight uh, temporal assessment of individuals' uh, brain health as well as their cognitive um, function. What we also hope to do is that if we could prioritize individuals who are also part of the uh, seroprevalence study, is to include them within the neuroimaging study as well. Um, however, it's not an absolute, but it's a, it's a goal that we're working towards. In terms of who's um, involved, uh, essentially eight uh, sites of the CLSA are, will be involved, and they basically were selected based on the feasibility of acquiring uh, neuroimaging using a 3 Tesla, as well as whether these sites were also already involved in multi-site um, studies including neuroimaging uh, from other national studies. Uh, we do appreciate this is a fairly uh, complex um, um, a study to initiate, especially given the current circumstances. So we are proposing to have three sites initiate the study and then sequentially add sites as we move along. Um, in terms of the scanning protocol, for those of you who may be interested, we are using the Canadian Dementia Imaging Protocol, and it is chosen because it is already a protocol that's used wise, widely, again, uh, um, among many national studies of neuroimaging. Um, it's also been shown to be um, robust across different uh, types of scanners, including Philips, Siemens, um, et cetera. Um, within the protocol, we would be able to acquire structural um, information regarding the brain, as well as detection of uh, covert lesions such as white matter lesions, microbleeds. Um, we also will be looking at white matter integrity using diffusion imaging. And again, 10 minutes of resting state functional MRI will be required so that we can look at functional connectivity. Because this particular protocol has been um, established um, for, for a while now, we are also working with uh, Simone Duchenne from Laval University to essentially provide a little bit of an upgrading to this um, protocol so that it is um, more kind of aligned to current standards. So for, for, um, for instance, for the diffusion imaging, we are hoping to add more directionality to it so that it, again, it is at par to what is expected for current neuroimaging studies. In terms of the um, paired phone assessment, as I mentioned, it will focus on uh, acquiring cognitive function using, again, the current CLSA battery. Uh, in addition to cognitive function, we'll also look at aspects of sleep, as well as mood, physical activity, and subjective cognitive decline, um, as, and then um, including anxiety as well. Height and weight will be self-reported. And then lastly, just to flag, I guess, the sort of the potential of acquiring these uh, neuroimaging scans at this point in time. So as, again, um, everyone appreciates, CLSA has been um, following uh, the current cohort for a number of years now since 2010. Um, and we're currently just uh, sort of in the completion of follow-up two. This neuroimaging study essentially will be occurring during follow-up three, if you look at the years by which the acquisition will occur from baseline to the two-year scanning um, 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 estimates. Um, and so while we're kind of currently, I suppose, um, only acquiring neuroimaging within follow-up three, because the cohort or because the real estate participants will be continually be followed prospectively and their cognition will be reassessed repeatedly, we could technically then look at whether um, there's any potential effects of COVID-19 infection on the risk of dementia over time, which again, um, I would say other platforms right now or other initiatives cannot provide that sort of long-term potential. Um, and I think that's it. Great. Thanks, Teresa. You're welcome. So if anybody has any questions, I see a couple of them have been uh, starting to post for either Dr. Reina or, or uh, Dr. Lou Ambrose. Please feel free to put them in the chat box. And I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Basta. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you, Parmen and Teresa, for your excellent overviews of all the CLSA COVID studies. 
I'm going to be sharing with you today um, some of the work that we've been doing to produce a COVID-19 dashboard that currently covers the baseline findings from the first COVID-19 survey. So this dashboard um, I mentioned a few months ago, if you've participated in the CLSA webinars before, it's now available online. The address is here in the address bar. Um, it's at the normal CLSA website slash COVID dash study re results. And um, if you click this link, you'll be able to um, go to the English version of the dashboard. The French version should be online later today. And what I'd like to do is just give you a quick orientation or a quick um, tutorial about how to use the dashboard, highlight a couple of key results, and then uh, leave time for questions. So when you um, enter the dashboard, you'll see that we have six tabs on the side, in, in addition, a tab about the survey. And these tabs kind of divide the baseline survey into different topics and different categories that you might be interested in. The, the dashboard is really optimized for use on a desktop or laptop computer rather than on a mobile phone. And that is because the graphs are quite wide. On each page, we have a summary, a set of summary boxes at the top that give some of the key findings or key statistics about the findings. And you can also read about the survey um, in more detail to understand more about the sampling and what participants were included here. Um, beginning with the participant demographics, um, if you click these three lines, you'll be able to widen the dashboard and see it a little bit more clearly. Um, participants um, demographics include the age of the participants that participated in the baseline survey, the location where they were residing at the time of the survey, their type of dwelling, and the number of people that live in their household. Um, the way that the dashboard works is that we provide an overview with very basic graphs and histograms of the distribution of each variable that's plotted. And if you um, roll over any part of the graph, it'll show you the percent of participants in that category and the count of the overall sample size. As Parminder mentioned, 28,559 participants um, answered the baseline survey. And the collection dates of this survey were April 15, 2020 to May 30th, 2020. And that's important because you'll see that some of the questions ask about participant activities or behavior in the past month. The dashboard also has the opportunity or allows you the opportunity to filter the results by both age and sex for most um, questions. So, for instance, if we look at the distribution of respondents by geographic area within Canada, we can um, also see whether the distribution by age group varies or um, or and also stratify by sex. So here are the distribution for female participants and male participants. And again, if you roll over any of the bars, you can find out what percentage of participants in that category um, responded to the survey. Once you've finished looking at a particular plot, you can, you can roll it up so that you can see more detail about additional plots um, below. And again, for each of these, we tried to keep a really consistent look by allowing you to filter by age and sex or to just re review the overall um, summary for that variable. Once you've reviewed a single tab, you can go back up to these three little bars and reveal the tabs again and look for um, the categories of questions that you might be most interested in. For instance, if we jump ahead to the COVID-19 health tab, um, you'll see that 73 out of the 28,559 participants reported that they had been diagnosed with COVID-19 during the baseline survey between April and May 2020. In addition, 237 were hospitalized for any reason in the month prior to the survey. About 12% had had a healthcare visit in that past month, and um, about 26% reported that they had experienced a dry cough in the month prior to the survey. So a lot of these findings are actually very interesting, and I won't be able to go through all of them, but I really do encourage you to um, take a look at the dashboard and um, review some of the findings yourself. So, for instance, if we wanted to see what the age or sex distribution was of those individuals that tested positive, that's this category right here. Um, we would go back up and widen the plots a little bit, and we could scroll over and see what percentage of each of the individuals that were positive were in each of the age groups by sex. In addition, a large number of participants were tested for COVID, even though uh, a few number had turned up positive. So about 500 reported being tested for COVID in the month prior to the, to the baseline survey. 
And then when we look at the most common symptoms of COVID-19, you can see that a high proportion of participants, about 26%, um, as I mentioned, had experienced a dry cough, but even about 15% had experienced shortness of breath or difficulty breathing in the month prior to the survey. Um, we asked in the survey about many different symptoms. So here on this plot, you're able to choose um, any combination of symptoms that you might like and um, plot those in comparison to one another to see how commonly reported they were among participants in the survey. And then again, you can filter by age and sex as well if you'd like to see how those different um, uh, demographics play out with regards to these symptoms. Um, let's see. Another, uh, so then we have tabs about physical health. So how participants uh, physical reported their comorbidities and their physical health. The COVID-19 um, results, as I just showed you, participant behavior, things like um, whether they were in self-quarantine, if they had left home, and for what reasons, um, and I encourage you to take a look at those. Um, many of these questions compare what the participants were doing in the month prior to the survey um, and in the past to try to see if there were changes in the early period of the pandemic. We have another tab looking at some of the questions related to working outside the home and volunteering outside the home and how work and volunteer um, activities were affected by the pandemic. And then this lap, last tab looks at participant mental health during COVID-19. And I think this tab um, really drills down to a lot of the really significant effects that COVID-19 has had on participants, even at this early period in the pandemic. For instance, about 60% had experienced separation from their family. About 22% were unable to access usual health care during this time. About 20% had um, evidence of the presence of depressive symptoms. And about 6% were experiencing moderate or severe anxiety during this period. So overall, about 52% of participants indicated that the consequences of COVID-19 on themselves and their households was negative, And about 4 or 5% indicated that it was very negative. Um, so that's something that to explore. And if you were to scroll down even further, you could see how um, some of the consequences of the pandemic were on the um, absence or presence of depressive symptoms, um, on anxiety, and on some of the specific experiences that individuals reported during COVID-19. Things like, um, as I mentioned, separation, unable to access usual health care, but also the loss of income or unable to be able to access necessary supplies or food, or unable to care for those um, who require assistance. Um, and a couple of other experiences that were less common, but also reveal some interesting patterns. For instance, um, increased time caregiving was most significantly reported by those in the youngest age groups, shown here in dark blue, um, and more commonly reported by uh, females compared to males. So that is the quick overview of the dashboard. I did want to highlight that we have created this dashboard for informational purposes. So you'll see that these are really not the complete results. Um, we haven't provided any confidence intervals or um, any more complex an analyses. The idea is to, is to provide trends um, to demonstrate how the pandemic has been impacting participants in the CLSA who completed the baseline survey and to kind of give an overview to kind of spark additional research questions and interest. Um, in addition, as I mentioned, this is the baseline based on the baseline survey, the baseline dashboard. We'll be working on creating dashboards um, that compare the changes over the weekly and monthly surveys. And then with the exit survey, once it's completed, trying to compare what has changed over this time period as well. So I think with that, um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And I'd be happy to answer any questions um, if there are any about the dashboard um, as well. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I just wanted to, it's Jennifer here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, touch base about data access uh, with the CLSA. This was just, I'm, I'm winging this because Shirley has just told me to, uh, to speak to this a little bit, um, but the data act, is there another slide, Shirley? Because this is all I'm, all right. That's it. Okay, so just data access will be, uh, I guess these are in my notes. You're catching me off guard here. Hang on a second.
I'm just going to... Jennifer, uh, I yes. already mentioned that around okay. the access, so in the interest of time, maybe... Okay, perfect. Basically, basically, I said that there are some internal analyses that are happening now as per funding conditions, and the people who currently hold CLSA data, they have active data access agreements. If they want, they can apply, they can call, uh, go through the CLSA access email and ask for these data when they become available. They won't be available till uh, sometime in, uh, in early next year, because we are still cleaning some of the weekly and biweekly and still collecting monthly data. So once the whole data collection is closed, then it will be available to other researchers. And then the final, as I mentioned, that the data are going to be becoming part of the core CLSA data set. So when people apply, in the future, and as part of the checklist on the data access application, they can check if they would like to have access to these data. So that's our data access plan. I also wanted to add something that the, the dashboard right now is only based on the baseline data, as Nicole mentioned, but the plan is to add weekly, biweekly, and monthly tabs to the uh, to the dashboard, so it will be updated as those data become available. Uh, if I'm correct, that uh, 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 that the weekly are going to be coming soon. They are being cleaned up and prepared for the dashboard. And somebody had asked a question about these are the these the COVID data that uh, Nicole presented are all unweighted data. They are not weighted for sampling weights. We are working with our statistician to create sample weights uh, sometime in the near future. Just there's only so many hours in a day and resources available to us. Great. Thanks, Parminder. Um, there was a question, I think, from Margaret a little while back during uh, um, Teresa's presentation, and it was, why dilute your two main groups? No symptoms does not guarantee a negative COVID status, and many symptoms are consistent with COVID. Why not just test all who enter the study? And if you can answer that no. quickly so that we don't miss it. Yeah, sure. No, I read that as well. And it's certainly a, like a core question that we were considering throughout our um, study design, et cetera. So I think one, it, that, that's part of the challenge of working um, I, I guess um, the research within more community-based um, individuals versus uh, looking at the effects of COVID-19 in those people who frankly are hospitalized because of a fairly serious manifestation of the COVID-19 um, virus. So we don't have the capacity. So I guess just to clarify testing. So I'm assuming um, they're talking about maybe swab testing everybody. Um, so one that we don't have that particular capacity and also too someone could have a negative swab but previously had the infection um, and then uh, and that and so the other part is that that's partly why we're trying to pair with the seroprevalence study as much as possible but again uh, we don't know right now how long antibodies may last if it is if one has been previously infected so it is a challenge. Um, I fully admit to that and something we've been thinking about a lot. Um, I don't know if there's a perfect solution. Um, we are prioritizing those individuals who clearly either, uh, who are, who have tested positive previously based on the sales state questionnaire study responses. And we are not just using the baseline, but really the most recent available data per individual to uh, identify people from that perspective. And I think what we see as the biggest challenge is that those who um, who may be deemed as, you know, negative or without COVID could, again, at any point along the way, so not even at baseline, but remember, because they're following people over time, depending on how long this pandemic persists for, is that they would convert into uh, a positive. So that's some of the challenges we'll have to consider as we model and look at the data moving forward. But yeah, I fully recognize it's a challenge and we have tried to think about every possible scenario, but given the virus and it's not and what we know of it right now, it's 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 um it's just hard to find an absolute absence of right now. Um I'm actually I'm going to ask a question now which was directed to Dr. Basta about the software you used. I, I don't think you replied to it in the chat, but also um 
beyond that technical question, how do other researchers add their results to facilitate knowledge mobilization uh, using using this the dashboard? Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, the dashboard was created using um, Shiny apps in R. Um, I don't know of a way for other researchers to add their results, although I know there are plans to add each of the different dashboards on a main CLSA landing page. So perhaps there would be an opportunity there. Um, but right now, it, the dashboards are sort of standalone, and um, it's not possible to add additional uh, plots there, so it wouldn't need to be at another in another link or another location. So there, uh, was, a, there was a question from someone about the uh, sequencing of the positive people. Uh, yes, on whom we have DNA stored, there are around 140 individuals right now. Either they told us that they went for a test and they tested positive, plus either their doctor told them that they were positive, so definite and presumed positives, let's say. Their total number is around, to date, 282 individuals in the CLSA. Out of that, 142 or so are in the comprehensive, from the comprehensive part of the CLSA, where we did collect a DNA from them. So we are uh, sharing that with the, uh, again, another uh, federally funded project, which is the GenHost that is looking at the sequencing of the people who tested positive, but it's based on the stored DNA. So we are working with GenHost and we are uh, providing them with the DNA to do the sequencing. Great. I'm uh, just before people start to leave, I also wanted to remind you to fill out the evaluation that should have popped up on your screen now. Um, I don't see any new questions having come up. So uh, while I'm going through the last few bits and bytes of the uh, presentations, uh, please feel free to post the questions. If we did miss a question, we will follow up uh, via email to get that answer. So again, once again, I'd like to thank our three presenters for uh, taking the time today. We had a lot of interest in providing an overview of, of what the CLSA was doing uh, related to COVID-19 research. Um, and as uh, Dr. Reyna said, the, the CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications will be on January 27th, and that's in 2021. Uh, just, so to, just to correct, we, uh, the next year's deadlines are going to be changed. So please okay. uh, uh, view our website when we have that update on it. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, so again, the survey in the bottom right hand, I believe, corner, if you can complete that. Um, and for our next webinar, if you can join us in the new year for our next webinar, uh, it's, I'm not going to say it in French because I will not do it justice, but it will be a, a French webinar entitled Health Profile of Francophone Seniors in Manitoba, and it will be presented by Dr. Ende Rukahaya Gaye. Uh, and please remember that the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we invite you to follow us on Twitter at CLSA underscore, C under, underscore ELCV. Um, it's gonna, I don't think I see any other questions. Does any of our presenters have any final comments? Yeah, I, I'm just going to add something that uh, the, the study that Teresa was talking about, um, uh, the brain imaging one, we are adding additional two elements to it. Uh, we are still working out. One is that we are hoping to collect stool samples for doing microbiome uh, studies. And second part is that uh, olfactory testing, so try to do a uh, assess the capability of people to do the smell test, and both are implicated in uh, in uh, brain health, and that's uh, that's another two elements to it. Um, there was also one more question. Um, hope I hope I hope I do it justice. Are there serum COVID nineteen IgM and IgG levels in the data? And if yes, are these levels at cross section? 
or their change in follow-up informative regarding time of exposure in any way? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, these are the, 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 we will be getting the actual concentrations of those two uh, antibody markers, and they, we will have to determine whether they are going to be available in the data set or we will be just giving the positive or negative. That needs to be determined yet. Uh, uh, what second part was that, what was the question? I, the second part I sort of forgot. Um, it was, if yes, are these levels at cross-section or their change and follow-up informative regarding time of exposure in any way? Well, we didn't have time to go into the design. We've been trying to, because the underlying uh, dynamic of the pandemic is changing rapidly, so and the sample collections are happening over a longer period of time, so that poses some challenges. So we have, for collection, not the same individuals, unique individuals. We are collecting data in three windows. The first one is November 2nd to December 20th. And so we will be able to estimate prevalence in that window for age and uh, at the province level. And then the second window of the new random sample of the CLSA participants will go from January 15th to more uh, January 15 to end of February, and then the third window is from March 1 to uh, middle of April. And with that, we are collecting as much information we can through questionnaire to, to know when they provided a blood sample and what was happening with the pandemic at that point in time to really understand when the potential I don't think we can really tell when they got exposed to it. All we can tell is in that window when uh, when they completed the blood sample and when we analyzed and what the seroprevalence is. That's the extent of what you can do. So it is a cross-section in that sense. And uh, unless we had more resources or capabilities to do some um, uh, the swaps, there's no other way to link it to the exposures. Exposure happened some point in time prior to the sample testing. Maybe, Nicole, you have something else to add to that. No, I think that was a really great response, Parminder. Um, since these seroprevalence surveys are really aimed at trying to provide population level estimates of the seroprevalence across jurisdictions, um, we hadn't really thought about trying to make an assessment of when the person was exposed. And I'm not sure that the science is there yet to be able to determine um, enough about waning immunity and the duration of, of the antibody response to know when someone had been exposed just from a single sample or even two samples. Um, I just, there's one last uh, question and I can't recall if it was answered or not. It came in um, privately. Do you think it may be helpful to matching the CLSA participants with the COVID alert is it maybe COVID alert or would it be COVID alert application? Probably alert application to encourage them to use the application and collect that data. Uh, difficult to answer that question because you run into lots of ethics and privacy issues that, and uh, don't know. I, first of all, I don't know what that app is and, uh, and what the implications of that are. And, uh, I don't think we can technically link our participant to an outside app that easily. Is this the app for Public Health Agency of Canada that they had, uh, or Health Canada had uh, introduced? I think it's that one. And we talked about it at one point in time, but uh, ethics and privacy and confidentiality issues make it a bit challenging. At least that's what I recall from previous discussions here. So many discussions that have happened about this whole topic in a very short period of time. So it's hard to keep track of everything we decided and discarded or kept. <laughs> so I know we had an app conversation, but I can't remember what exactly the rationale was. Lots of potential here, and hopefully uh, everyone got a good overview of what the CLSA is up to these days. Um, I think we're right on time and there's no more questions, so we can end there. So thank you again for the presenta presenters and for all the very positive comments that we've received in the chat box.
Um, I hope everybody has a great holiday season, and we will see you again for our next webinar in January. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.